Thanks for everything. Thanks for coming down. We appreciate it. I picked the food. Yeah, goddamn right. And I can't argue with you, brothers. Outside the house. That's exactly right. right. That's exactly right. This is my first video update coming to you from downtown Nicosia, Cyprus. I am currently at a place known as Freedom Independence Square. I like to call this area the uh, alien spaceship because this, uh, this design is so bizarre. It is, it, it's, it looks like you're inside the spaceship of an alien movie. I don't understand how this fits into the architecture, the, the style and motif of, of, of Cyprus and Nicosia, but it took them 15 years to, <laughs> to build this thing. Anyway, and they're still building, by the way. They're still building down that way in that direction. And, and if you walk all the way down that way, so it's not quite complete yet. But anyway, enough uh, babbling on about Cypriot uh, architecture projects. Let's talk about Joe Bidenopoulos, Greece's favorite son. And you saw the video uh, intro there where Biden was meeting with the, uh, the mayor of Fort, Fort Myers, I believe. The mayor of Fort Myers in Florida. And uh, Biden told the, uh, the mayor of this town as he was visiting Florida to, Florida to survey the damage from Hurricane uh, Ian, Fort Myers Beach mayor. Uh, Biden met him and he shook his hand and then he said that uh, no one Fs with a Biden. And the mayor responded by saying, yeah, your go bleep right. Your go beep right. <laughs> so uh, that was a hot mic moment for uh, Biden as he was visiting uh, Florida. No one, and I mean no one, Fs with a Biden. A Biden, not with Biden himself, not with Joe. No one Fs with a Biden in general. That includes Hunter as well. Um, except for Corn Pop. Corn Pop, he can, he can F with a Biden. <laughs> and uh, MBS, MBS is definitely, uh, he is effing with, uh, with a Biden at this very moment. I guess that Biden was kind of saying that not even Hurricane Ian can, can mess with, uh, with a Biden as, as he was in Florida. I guess that's the context of, of what he, uh, he met when he was speaking with, uh, with this Florida mayor. Not even Hurricane Ian can take on Joe Biden. Not even a hurricane. Anyway, MBS, there's someone that's definitely uh, effing around with the Biden White House, according to the Biden White House, if you look at it from their point of view. And uh, the, the White House spokeswoman, Karine Jean-Pierre, she actually came out with a statement yesterday after OPEC Plus announced that they would be cutting production of oil by 2 million barrels a day. She came out and she said, and I quote, clearly OPEC plus has sided with Russia after today's announcement. Because if your country decides to act in its best interests, well, then you're siding with Russia because if those best interests go against the, uh, the Biden White House is, is plan and it's dictate, especially as they're about to head into midterms. And the last thing they want to see are uh, oil prices spike. After, after the OPEC uh, plus announcement, I believe the price of oil hit $93 uh, a barrel. But um, when you go against the, uh, the dictates and the orders of uh, King Biden, well, you're siding with Russia. You're... Uh, you're a Putin shill straight away. And so that was the statement from Karine Jean-Pierre. Let me play you a video and I may have to uh, actually may have to play that video in. Maybe I'll speed it up. Maybe I won't. I'm a little bit worried about the, the copyright for the video. So maybe I'll play it, but I'll speed it up. But what you have is uh, is the Saudi 
I believe he's the Saudi OPEC uh, representative and he's taking questions during the OPEC plus meeting and he feels a question from Reuters. And uh, before the Reuters, well, before the Reuters uh, journalists can even give the question, the uh, OPEC Saudi ministers like, dude, o uh, Reuters guy, before you even give me your question, I just want to call you out for your fake reporting because you've been running around uh, putting together stories claiming that uh, MBS and Putin, Saudi Arabia and Russia, they conspired and they schemed together to, uh, to agree on this 2 million barrels a day uh, price uh, uh, oil production cut. And you're running with this story claiming that, claiming that this is some, some sort of Saudi-Putin conspiracy to, uh, to agree to, to this production cut. And he just completely just demolished this Reuters reporter. He didn't even let the Reuters guy get his questions in. He said, you're not even, I'm not even going to take your questions anymore because you show a complete lack of respect for uh, the, the, the Saudi government and for Saudi Arabia's sovereignty. Anyway, let me play you the video. I'm going to probably speed it up a bit, but I'll put a link for the original um, unsped uh, video down below. Alex Lola from Reuters News Agency. Um, I have two questions. So, but, no, no, Alex, I have to talk to you about So you have got it wrong. Okay. <laughs> and you have got it wrong twice. Before I ask the question. I'll and you will get it three, the third time if you, you know, you did, uh, as a writer, did not do a proper job. You talked about Russia doing this and that. And actually, the day that your story came out, no one from Russia talked to me, nor I talked to anybody from Russia. You repeated that again with another tale of a story prior to that, that Saudi and Russia, blah, 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 are congregating around a $100 price. That is not true. We, and I spent 20 minutes from one of your respected mem uh, members of uh, your peer in Dubai explaining to her, or actually 25 minutes, why we don't go as Saudi Arabia for price targeting. And that 25 minutes went in vain, and I really don't like that. I acted in a very respectful way, emanating from respecting the agency, and I think, but you elected, you elected to choose a phantom Saudi source, saucy source, if I can do it as British as I could. <laughs> but if you have question, direct it to others, but not me. I'm not talking to Reuters, until you respect the source, which is the energy minister, on behalf of the Saudi government. Okay, thank you. I so you will ask the questions to any of my colleagues. Okay, so that was a very interesting exchange between Saudi Arabia and Reuters. And uh, MBS, well, MBS um, needs to watch his back. Saudi Arabia needs to be very careful because when you take a look at the, the statements coming out of the Biden White House, they are furious, furious with uh, this oil production cut. Remember, Biden was in Saudi Arabia about a month, a month and a half ago, and he was coming back saying, um, you know, I've agreed with uh, MBS to increase oil production by one million barrels a day, which was complete fiction. Saudi Arabia actually had to, uh, had to correct the Biden White House statements saying that, no, 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 we're not increasing production by a million barrels a day. As a matter of fact, what we said was that we're hoping to increase capacity by 2027 to add an additional 1 million barrels a day. By 2027, they're looking to increase capacity. There was no such uh, guarantees given to the Biden White House, but the Biden White House ran with this lie, uh, this lie fake narrative that Biden went to Saudi Arabia and he convinced MBS to increase uh, oil production. What we're seeing, uh, what we saw yesterday was, was the complete unequivocal um, demolition of that lie because Saudi Arabia, along with OPEC Plus and UAE and the UAE and other OPEC members and, and Russia, other OPEC Plus members, they've agreed to actually cut the oil production price. And uh, this has got the Biden White House absolutely furious. Regime change, color revolution is going to be on the table for MBS and Saudi Arabia. No doubt about it. And... Um, since we're talking about regime change and color revolution, let's switch over to one of the uh, one of the masterminds, one of the key players, the key neocon players when it comes to regime change and color revolution. Revolutions. One of the the, the architects of the Iraq WMD line of the Iraq WMD lie, Mr. John Bolton, and uh, John Bolton 
he came out with an article the other day where he is calling for not only the removal of Putin, he is calling for a full-on, complete regime change of all current Kremlin officials. And Bolton, in the uh, article that he penned for a magazine called, for a publication called 19... 19- 45, an online journal called 1945. In this article, he claims that the only way for Europe to uh, achieve peace and security is if the entire uh, Putin administration is removed. Former White House National Security Advisor John Bolton insisted on Wednesday that only regime change in Moscow can achieve long-term U.S. objectives in Europe. He proposed funding Russian dissidents who could team up with mid-level officers to overthrow President Vladimir Putin in a coup. Quote, there is no long-term prospect for peace and security in Europe without regime change in Russia, Bolton argued in an article titled Putin Must Go, which was published by the online journal 1945. Change must involve far more than simply replacing Putin, according to Bolton. The whole regime must go. Bolton actually opened the article by quoting President Joe Biden, who said in March, for God's sakes, this man cannot remain in power. Biden's aides had scrambled to walk that back with Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, arguing that we do not have a strategy of regime change in Russia or anywhere else for that matter. The very next day, however, Biden insisted he wasn't backpedaling and that his remarks were not articulating a policy change, but expressing moral outrage. And I make no apologies for it. That's a quote from Biden. So Biden made that uh, that statement when he was giving a speech in Poland. And obviously the United States government, the U.S. government, the Biden White House, any White House for that matter, cannot openly admit that they support a policy of regime change for uh, a country like uh, like Russia for a country as powerful and as significant as the Russian Federation that's on the record off the record their policy was regime was regime change always has been regime change that has been the entire purpose of this proxy war against Russia that's the purpose of this Ukraine conflict with Russia goading Russia into a conflict with Ukraine was all about regime change the economic sanctions the shock and awe sanctions was about regime change not abiding not adhering to the minsk accords or if you want to call them the elon musk uh elon elon musk elon musk uh, accords um all of this has been about regime change in russia all of it that is the off record reality the interesting part about all of this is that now at this moment for the past week or two you now have various deep state mainstream media publications i would say a majority of the uh of the collective west media deep state publications as well as a lot of uh, collective west analysts and pun- analysts and pundits and former white house officials like john bolton going on the record stating that the absolute goal with this conflict in Ukraine is Putin regime change. Putin must go. It's not even a clever um, title that John Bolton is using. He is just repackaging, reusing the Assad must go uh, meme, narrative, whatever you want to call it, um, that they were using way back in 2000. When was it? 2000. 11 12 13 remember assad must go assad must go that's all obama was saying for the better part of two three years uh, assad must go angela merkel assad must go everyone was saying assad must go so now bolton is just rehashing that uh that phrase and he's now just saying putin must go this is a beautiful tree by the way isn't it i've never noticed this tree but it's nice very nice um so that is the, the article that Bolton penned. And it's just an open admission um, from a deep state operative like Bolton, a deep state insider, neocon insider, just openly admitting that the goal, the absolute goal to all of this is a regime change in Russia.
and I've been saying this now for for a couple of weeks now, that uh, the goal of everything that is going on in Ukraine, including this uh, this Kherson um, counteroffensive or offensive or whatever you want to call it, this Kherson advancement, where Ukraine is moving everything they've got. We're talking reservists from Odessa, from Kiev, from Sumy. They're taking everything they, they, they have and they are making a big push to take Kherson city. All of this is about creating uh, the optics, the narrative that Russia is disintegrating, the Putin government is collapsing, mobilization is a failure, his only option is tactical nukes, and we have to get this guy out of office. And I'll, I'll repeat what I said yesterday in my video, because I think it's an important point. The U.S. administration, the collective West, they're not concerned about who replaces Putin the administration that replaces Putin. They're not concerned about that. Even if it's a hardliner, even if it's someone who's hawkish and more hardline than Putin, because Putin is a moderate. He is without a doubt a moderate uh, force in the Kremlin. But even if Putin is replaced with a hardliner, the, the collective West doesn't care because their goal is first, let's get Putin out. Then we'll deal with whatever hardliner or anyone else you know, comes in to replace Putin and eventually we'll get our guy who will be Navalny or who knows. Um, who's that chess player, that, that knucklehead chess player, Kasparov or Khodorovsky or someone like that. Um, it doesn't matter for them who it is in the short term. As long as they get that person, as long as they get the person that they want out which in this case is Putin. Remember, Syria was the same case. Assad must go. Putin must go from Bolton. Assad must go. How are we going to get rid of Assad? We'll fund ISIS. Absolutely. <laughs> that, was the, that was the policy. That was the plan. We'll get IS to, to uh, make a run at Damascus. What was the plan? To make a run at Damascus, to take over Damascus. The Assad government will fall. And then we'll deal with these guys later, the, uh, the IS guys. We'll deal with them later. But first, let's get Damascus to fall. And IS was 12 kilometers. I remember it like it was yesterday. IS was 12 kilometers from Damascus. It was right there. Obama's plan was working. The neocon plan was working. And 12 kilometers away from Damascus, and what happened? Putin steps in. The Russian Air Force steps in and they absolutely demolish. Ah, yes. And the neocons were furious with Russia because they were so close to achieving their regime change in Syria. So close. And Putin, Putin spoiled it. And they have not forgiven him for that. So that is Bolton openly talking about regime change in Russia. Full regime change. That means Lavrov must go. That means Zaharova must go. That means Shoigu must go. Um, Medvedev. Bolton is saying they all must go. And Bolton is saying it's, it's, not, it's not how you find, it's not the way to find peace in Ukraine. Bolton is saying this is the only way to find peace and stability in Europe. So, so Bolton is very clever. He's framing this as a European solution. It's the only way to, to find a European solution. You have to blow up Nord Stream 1 and, and Nord Stream 2, and you have to remove the Russian, uh, the Putin administration, right? Is that the plan? <laughs> is that how this works? <laughs> right? Is that, is that the neocon strategy? First, you sever the uh, pipeline and energy connections, and then you work on uh, removing the, uh, the Russian administration, the Kremlin government. Let me go back real quick before I forget, talking about the, the Kherson uh, offensive and how I was mentioning that Ukraine is throwing everything they have at the Kherson offensive so that they can um, take Kherson city, which will, according to, to the deep state, to the collective West, which will help push along the, uh, the regime change uh, plans. Um, something interesting happened a couple of days ago that not many people are talking about 
And uh, when, when this offensive in uh, this advancement in Kherson was happening, drones, Russian drones, Iranian drones, whatever, uh, drones, they penetrated deep into Ukraine territory. We're talking 300 kilometers from the uh, front lines deep. We're talking next to Kiev deep. And they took out uh, a Ukrainian, um, I think it was like a, a training center or a command center. They completely took it out. Four or six drones. They pushed all the way deep, 300 kilometers to a place called uh, Bilaya Tserkov. Bilaya Tserkov. And this is a place which is right next to Kiev in the Kiev Oblast. I believe a little, a little further south from Kiev. They went all the way in, um, avoided air defense, went in, took out this military uh, training uh, center or this military command post, completely tore it up. And that was it, these kamikaze drones deep into the Ukrainian um, rear. Pretty much, I don't want to say the heart of Kiev, but, you know, in the region of Kiev. And they accomplished this. And not many people are talking about it, but to me, I look at something like this and I think to myself, if this isn't indirect, direct, indirect, I don't know, if this isn't proof or evidence that, uh, that Ukraine, that the Alensky regime has gone all in with regards to Kherson, so far in with regards to Kherson that they've left their entire uh, country, their entire uh, rear exposed to, uh, to a Russian advance. I don't know what is. I don't know what is because uh, these drones did some serious damage. They did some serious damage and they, and they just, they flew right on in there. No problems at all. And uh, I actually heard, there, there, were, there were rumors. I didn't hear it. I read, <laughs> I read uh, various posts and rumors, rumors, keep that in mind, that uh, the Alensky administration, which is so, so concerned with optics, is obsessed with media and optics, that they were furious that videos and photos of the, of the attack and the burning military facilities in uh, Bilaya Tserkov were published. They were absolutely furious because it shows that they are indeed exposed. And if Kiev is exposed, well, Odessa is also exposed because a lot of reservists, from what I understand, are being pulled from Odessa and thrown to, uh, to the Kherson uh, advance. So anyway, that is Bolton. I went off on a little, little sidetrack there, but I, I, always for, I, I forgot yesterday to talk about that, so I wanted to, to, throw, that, to throw that in there. Anyway, uh, Bolton was also on the Pierce Morgan uh, show, and he was on the Pierce Morgan show with Stella Assange, the wife of Julian Assange. I believe it, it, is, it is Stella, if I am not mistaken. Uh, Stella Morris. Stella Morris. My apologies. So he had uh, Stella Morris, the wife of uh, Julian Assange, and John Bolton on the same show on the same show and uh john bolton actually said to pierce morgan with assange's wife in the studio bolton was in uh was was via video link he actually said that he believes that assange deserves 176 years in prison he actually said that assange is no more journalist than the chair that he's sitting on i really wish i could play this video but I am a thousand percent sure that I'm going to get crushed if I put this video on, uh, on this, if I play this video, if I play the Pierce Morgan video on this video, I'm positive that I'm going to get crushed by, uh, by the powers that be at YT. So I'm going to put a link to, uh, to this Pierce Morgan episode down below as well. So you can check it out. It's about a minute, a minute long, a minute plus, but, uh, Stella, Stella Morris completely lays into Bolton calls him out for uh, for his warmongering and the fact that he lied about Iraq WMDs and, and all the damage that he's done to the world. And uh, it, it's, it's a fascinating exchange 
But man, Bolton is, that guy is some kind of evil. I am telling you. Uh, let's see, Biden, Bidenopolis, since we're talking about Bidenopolis and Bolton, we're talking about these two guys. There is um, a report from the Daily Telegraph. The Daily Telegraph in the UK. They are saying, they are reporting that, uh, that the Biden White House is actually now stating that uh, the advancements of Ukraine in the Kherson direction are quite encouraging. And they believe that at this current pace, the Ukraine military will indeed be able to uh, take Crimea. That is what they believe. According to sources in the White House, this is from the Daily Telegraph, the UK Daily, Daily Telegraph, the pace of advancement of Ukrainian troops in the Kherson region is encouraging. The Biden administration believes that the armed forces of Ukraine are able to seize the Crimea if the successful counteroffensive in the Kherson region continues. You see where they're going with all of this? Ukraine's gonna, Ukraine has to get Kherson city. If they get Kherson city, then they're gonna make a march towards Crimea. We better remove Putin, otherwise Crimea's lost. And by the way, Putin, don't get any funny ideas and launch a tactical nuke because we're watching you. And that's why they're running with this whole Russia tactical nuke thing, right? There, you, you, can, you can see the narrative that they're forming, the narrative that they're building in the hopes that uh, this, th this regime change that they're engineering actually works. That's what they're hoping for. That is what they're hoping for. And, th and this is what they're trying to build. They're trying to build the scenario the optics, the reasoning for, uh, for some sort of uh, regime change in, in the Kremlin. Let's see. We have another interesting story that I want to get to. And then I think I'll wrap up this video. And I'm thinking of walking this way. I'm, I'm now underneath the spaceship, underneath the mothership of Nicosia. <laughs> Here, what, a, what a monstrosity this is. <laughs> Um, what about planting trees? Whatever happened to planting trees? There's music this way, so I won't go. They're playing some pop music that way. I'm not sure who. Maybe Britney Spears or Harry Styles. Maybe they're playing Harry Styles, and I don't want to get flagged by Harry Styles there. Um, so I'll walk up this way. I'll walk underneath the other uh, tunnel over there, which is still being built. But um, there's an interesting story that, is, uh, that came out via the New York Times. And this is the part that, you know, kind of floored me. I was kind of like, whoa, the New York Times, really? Why are they running with this? Obviously, this has been leaked. This has been leaked to the uh, New York Times. And I'm still trying to figure out why is the New York Times running with this? Why has this been leaked? And why are they publishing this? It has to do with uh, Daria Drugina. And um, the story via, I'm sorry, CNN. Did I say New York Times? I think New York Times and CNN, actually. New York Times and CNN, yes. Both of them. They're, uh, they're pushing this story out. And uh, it's saying that U.S. intelligence community believes that the car bombing that killed Daria Drugina, the daughter of Alexander Drugin, was authorized by elements within the Ukrainian government. Sources briefed on the intelligence told CNN, okay, so CNN, they got the intel and the NYT is also publishing this story. So why is the NYT and CNN, why have they been given permission? Why have they been told to publish this story which states that US intel is openly admitting that Ukrainian officials assassinated Daria Drugina. Let me know in the comments down below, why are they, why are they being allowed to run with this story? Why are they admitting this? Uh, the US was not aware of the plan beforehand, according to the sources. And it is still unclear who exactly the US believes signed off on the assassination. 
It is also not clear whether the U.S. intelligence community believes that Ukrainian President Elensky was aware of the plot or authorized it, but the intelligence finding, first reported by the New York Times, which seemed to corroborate elements of the Russian authorities' findings that the car bombing was pre-planned. Russia has accused Ukrainian nationals of being responsible for the attack, which Ukraine had strongly denied in the aftermath of the explosion. Asking to comment, a Ukrainian defense intelligence official told CNN Wednesday evening following publication of the latest report that their agency had no new information on Dugina's death. Shortly after her death, the same official had told CNN that Ukraine had nothing to do with it. This is absolutely fascinating. NYT and CNN are both running with this story, claiming that U.S. intel officials have informed them that Ukraine, someone, somebody, some agency, they don't, they don't finger the SBU, they don't finger Ukrainian intel, and you can see they're, they're, they're kind of covering for Olensky, you know, saying, oh, you know, we're not sure if Olensky knew about this or not, or anything like that, but they're saying someone in Ukraine assassinated Daria Drugina, and the U.S. is claiming that they had nothing to do with it and they had no prior knowledge of this either. As a matter of fact, the, uh, these intel officials that spoke to uh, the NYT and to CNN for these stories, they're actually claiming that they're pretty frustrated with the fact that Ukraine, that there are elements in the Ukraine government that were doing this or that had planned this assassination without informing them. Let me read you from the NYT. The United States took no part in the attack, either by providing intelligence or other assistance, officials said. American officials also said they were not aware of the operation ahead of time and would have opposed the killing had they been consulted. Afterward, American officials admonished Ukrainian officials over the assassination, they said. Some American officials suspect Ms. Dugina's father, Alexander Dugin, a Russian, a Russian ultranationalist, was the actual target of the operation and that the, oper and that the operatives who carried it out believed he would be in the vehicle with his daughter. Really, really interesting uh, stuff going on here. Really interesting stuff. The U.S. officials would not say who in the American government delivered the admonishments or whom in the Ukrainian government they were delivered to. It was not known what Ukraine's response was. What do you guys think? What do you guys think is going on here? Let me know in the comments down below. I mean, obviously the U.S. is trying to distance itself from, uh, from this assassination, no doubt about it. They're trying to distance themselves and they're trying to make someone or some institution in Ukraine take the fall, right? I wonder if uh, they've got information, the U.S. intel services, if they've got information that uh, Russia, that Russian intel services, the FSB, um, if they're about to, uh, to close in on the, uh, on the assassins. And because they understand that the Russian uh, intel services are about to uh, are about to to apprehend some people and expose what happened to Daria Drugina, I wonder if they're running with this story, if they're trying to get ahead of what's about to happen. You know, and they're saying well, we had nothing to do with this. This was some Ukrainian official somewhere in the Alensky administration that that did this. Very interesting development. So let me finish up this video and let me talk about a clown world via the BBC. I'm trying to think, do I have anything else that I would like to talk about? Peskov gave a press conference the other day and when he was asked about the uh, the military operation in Ukraine, and now that you have these four new territories, as you can see that they're building here, these four new territories uh, are now part of the Russian Federation if the, uh, the military operation is going to change. And what did Peskov say? He said, no, it's still going to be a special military operation. 
and everyone was just like, oh my God, enough with this special military operation. Like everyone's just like, enough with this SMO. We've had enough. Um, you know, it's time to, uh, to rethink this, uh, this SMO. You know, when Peskov said that, everyone was just like, oh God, give it a break. Um, yep, we're still sticking with the SMO. Still sticking with the special military operation. Now, of course, just because uh, Peskov says that today it's going to remain a special military operation it doesn't mean that in a week or two weeks it can't change. I mean, he's just saying that as of this moment, as of today, it's still considered an SMO. And of course, if it's considered an SMO, I imagine that means that the Russian military is, uh, is bound by the uh, constraints of the, of the special military operation to this day. They're still bound by the constraints of the SMO. So I think that was an interesting development that took place yesterday as well. Joseph Burrell said that he's ready for a diplomatic solution, but he also said that the EU is, is still gonna train Ukrainian soldiers. Okay, Burrell is, is, a, is a tool of the uh, globalists. So he's got one foot in the door of, uh, of a diplomatic solution, whatever that, that even means. At this moment in time, because Zelensky has ruled it out, Zelensky has said there's going to be no diplomatic solution unless there is regime change in Russia. While at the same time, the EU is, uh, has said that they're going to be training Ukraine military in order to, uh, to fight this war for as long as they possibly uh, can in order to prolong and extend the conflict. Let's do our clown world and we will wrap this up. I think I've covered quite a lot of ground, haven't I? Oh, one more story before I get to my clown world. One more and it has to do with Nord Stream. There are, uh, there's talk and I think this is credible talk. And actually I believe Maria Zakharova even mentioned this during an interview that she was giving the other day, that uh, Nord Stream 1 has been, has been uh, ruined, <laughs> has been destroyed. But Nord Stream 2, which has two pipelines running side by side, from what I understand, Nord Stream 2 actually can deliver gas to Germany. One, one of the pipelines has been, uh, was targeted and, one, uh, and was destroyed, but the other pipeline of Nord Stream 2, from what I understand, either wasn't damaged or the damage is so minimal that the Russians have said they can repair it and fix it. And if if Germany wants to save itself from economic deindustrialization collapse, i.e. if Germany wants to act in the best interests of the German people, much like Saudi Arabia is acting in the best interests of Saudi Arabia, but if Germany wants to perhaps take a page from Saudi Arabia and look after its sovereignty, well, it can fix the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, the one pipeline, and it can get gas flowing. Will that happen? No, <laughs> no. We're talking about Nord Stream 2, which has already been sanctioned from, from here to, <laughs> to, to all the way down there. I mean, Nord Stream 2 has been sanctioned every which way you could possibly sanction a pipeline. And, uh, and the US would never let Germany actually take up Russia on their offer to repair the pipeline and to get gas flowing. Remember what Blinken said, it's a tremendous opportunity. Why would you, why would you squander a tremendous opportunity if you're the uh, United States? Why would you allow your vassal state to squander a tremendous opportunity for, uh, for the globalists? Anyway, now let's get to our clown world. Now let's do our clown world and wrap up this video. This is a quick clown world. It is coming from the British, the British state media channel known as the BBC. Oh no, known as the Times, my bad. No wait, it's a BBC reporter. I got it right the first time. <laughs> this is, I'm just reading you the article from the Times, the photos from the Times, uh, but it is a BBC reporter. So from the state media outlet known as the BBC, the UK state media propaganda outlet. Um, let's see here, they have an article and really the photo is the interesting part about it. But uh, the, the Times is running with an article with a title that says, in my 38 years at the BBC, 
it's been rare to witness events that can change history. This is one. It has this BBC reporter, Jeremy Brown, takes cover in Irpin as the town comes under attack. So he's in Ukraine. The town is coming under attack from the Russians. And this brave BBC reporter, this war correspondent, is saying, I've never seen this in my life. This is, I've covered so many wars in my history with the, uh, the British state media outlet known as the BBC. <laughs> and um, here I am. This is, this is, I've never seen this. I'm, here, here I am. Look, look, bombs are flying. Everything is, this is terrible. And he's lying there in the photo. And then, as you can see in the photo, there's like a woman with shopping bags kind of off to the side looking at him going, Sto? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> What's going on? What are you doing over there? Why are you lying down? <laughs> what, what are you? What's up? What's going on, BBC? <laughs> so you can see the photo. Uh, this made its rounds all over Telegram and, and Twitter. I thought it was a funny... Uh, a funny picture and it just exposes how everything they do is so staged now i'm not saying that these aren't war zones and i'm not saying that these aren't dangerous places to be obviously it's very dangerous to be reporting from these uh these areas and these front lines and this is a really serious uh seriously dangerous thing to do but um why do you have to stage it why do you have to stage these photo the, 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 these photo narratives, why do you have to do it? Can't you just report the truth? Can't you just say the truth for once instead of trying to manipulate us all the time? And didn't you see the woman in the background, BBC or The Times? Didn't you notice a woman standing there with shopping bags, looking at you, wondering what the hell is going on? What is this guy doing? Why is he lying down there? Anyway. That's the video, everybody. That's the clown world, the Duran.locals.com. And uh, Odyssey, Bitch Shoot, Rumble, Telegram, and Rockfin. Check us out there. Check out Alexander's channel. Check out the Duran's channel. And uh, I don't know if you can hear the, uh, the tennis balls. Back and forth, back and forth. Right here is... Uh, it's a tennis club right in the in the heart of Old Town Nicosia. I believe it's clay courts as well, which are always fun to play on. Clay courts are the best. Yeah, it is a tennis club right here. Awesome. All right. Take care.